So the story basically consists out of five courses, and then you get eight different wines to pair with those as well. On the other side, we also have beautiful things, which is one of my favorites. It's called the 10 a.m. 10 brunch pairing. And that's where we teach people how to enjoy wine with breakfast. You know, I drink three bottles of wine a day, and I figured out if you wait till the end of the day and drink three bottles, the next morning doesn't start that fresh. But if you start early in the morning and you pace yourself, it's much easier to work through those three bottles as well. So that's quite nice to see what breakfast dishes works with which cultivars. We have the kiss and tell, and that we usually focus on with what we're quite well known for, Chardonnays and Pinot Noirs. So currently we have three Chardonnays and three Pinot Noirs on our list, and that we basically then focus on those six wines when we do that pairing. So everything that we pair is paired with Chardonnay or Pinot Noir. We've got the small plate pairing, and that's where we give the consumer or the client who comes in the tasting room a little bit more of a choice. You know, as they say, some cars are heavier on fuel than others. So here we have a little blackboard that we change on a two-weekly basis, and that consists out of six little options you can choose from. They're all small plates. Any of those small plates can also be doubled up as a main course. You know, everyone is different that walks in here. The one guy says, I like my standard three course. Give me the first one as a starter, give me the third one as a main course, and they'll have a dessert afterwards. The next guy says, everything looks delicious, I can't choose. So that's why we have the small plates, so you can take all the small plates you want, or that your heart desires. Each of those dishes also pairs their own wines as well. The cheese pairing, chocolate pairing, that's either, that's either four wines, that's four wines with either four cheeses or four meats. There's some compots and breads that we all make in the kitchen as well, perfectly paired to those wines. We've got a vegan platter as well, because we get a lot of different clients here. We've got the gelato pairing as well, which we've uh, paired some gelatos with certain cultivars. We've got the chocolate pairing, so four different chocolates with four different wines. On our, on our dishes that we do as well, you'll see different herbs, different flowers, everything is edible and perfectly paired to the wine that goes with that dish as well. So we have, even have whole charts with herbs and flowers that you can pair with each of your wines. So even your garnishes are paired as well. And then we even have a non-alcoholic pairing, which is, in my opinion, quite boring. It's not as fun as the actual wine pairing. But, you know, sometimes you have a pregnant lady at the table, you have a designated driver who refuses to drink, or you have a reformed alcoholic. And then we have an option that they can still be part of the whole pairing experience. So what we've done is we've paired eight different teas with eight of our wines. And now, then we can substitute the, the wine with the teas. Then we also have a kiddies pairing. You know, start training their palates young. It's the best, I always say. There's no wine involved there. Um, that's all little drinks that they do. And then different snacks that they do on a little platter of five snacks. Like a healthy, snackish kind of snack. That, you know, kids don't always want to sit at the table and just, you know, eat a whole meal. They want to run around, and that's why we are quite kid-friendly as well. So even they can do their own little pairing as well. But we've had evenings where we pair certain songs to certain cultivars. So before we pair the wine, we actually, the DJ or the, the, the band will play a certain song which for them sort of resembles that wine the most. Seven days a week. We, we closed on uh, Christmas Day and New Year's Day. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Like I said, everything gets paired at creation, so um, I'm going to show you a, a little sneak preview today. I'll work in some extras in between as well, just so you guys can see what we are all about. And then feel free to ask any questions. I've been here nine years now, but uh, sometimes I forgot what I've learned nine years ago. And I just assume everyone else understands what I'm saying as well. So, Sorry. Uh, Jean-Claude and Carolyn Martin, but I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk all about that when we get go as we go through the story as well. No problems, no problems. And if there's anything that I do miss, just shout. What's your favorite pairing? Is there one that's particularly outlandish? Or um, like I said, the brunch pairing is, is quite interesting because it's so different. You know, I've, I've once read on the internet, the only meal without wine is breakfast. We've proven them wrong. So, uh, so that's quite an interesting one. I mean, you can do dinner pairings, you can do lunch pairings all over. Um, but a breakfast pairing is, is quite unique in my opinion. I agree that this one smells the most like passion fruit. For me it's a very nice wine to start off any meal to get the appetite going. Also just to get the mouth watering. And I often use this at home when I've got friends coming over and I'm not sure if they're going to enjoy my food or not. As soon as they walk in the door I give them a glass of this. By the time I feed them they eat like I'm the best chef in the world. Then the second one is our Sauvignon Blanc Semio blend. 80% Sauvignon Blanc, 20% Semio. So with the Semio added to it, it does sometimes mask a little bit of that passion fruit characters behind the savory, salty and herbaceous elements. So it definitely has a lot more layers on this one as well. However, we also put half the Sauvignon Blanc into oak barrels, which then for me sort of 
it grounds a little bit of the acidity and makes the wine a bit softer and smoother on the palate, but also it gives the wine a bit more mouthfeel. So we use this very uh, special cigar shaped sort of barrel that we get from France, um, and uh, these barrels were invented by Didi Dagano. And instead of having this round sort of egg-shaped barrels, where the lease all lies in the middle of the barrel, these ones, they spread the lease out in the barrel a little bit more. And that, for me, basically just more lease contact gives you that more mouthfeel as well. The barrels aren't that heavily toasted, so that's why they're not as round as well. So very light toast as well. So there's no that sort of uh, oaky, smoky element you get from a lot of wooden wines as well. It's all about balance, mouthfeel, and structure in the wine itself. But two complete different wines, as a beautiful coffee wine, the first one always great on a hot summer's day before any meal, like I said. Whereas this one for me, with the amount of layers you get from the blend, it's got a little bit more versatility when it comes to food, for instance. You can have something like salty, uh, bitter, sour, sweet, something like chameleon when it comes to food. So it adapts to all those different tastes on your plate as well. Alright, so this is just, like I said, to kickstart your palate. You guys can save on the first two wines. As soon as the glasses are empty, I'm going to bring you your first course with the first pairing. Excellent. Any questions? We're going to serve your welcome bread for you. And we're going to be serving this with the Viognier, which for me, in my opinion, is quite a nice floral, perfumey wine. It's not as acidic as the Sauvignon Blancs. When you smell it, first of all, it's like rose petals, white peaches, sweet melon. Then it's also on the palate, you get that more creamier, softer kind of taste. It's not, like I said, as sharp and acidic as Savion Blancs. However, it still has its own freshness. For me, it's almost like a little bit of a, and I don't know if this is the right wine term, but it's the best way for me to explain it. It's a lively zing in your mouth. Um, it's almost like a little bit of pickled ginger, like clean, fresh and spicy at the same time. So we were one of the first producers in this area to plant Viognier as well. And I want to tell you what the first chapter's name is. It's called What's in the Name. Now, everyone knows what the name is. It's Creation. So people always want to know, why Creation? How did this start? And for me, this picture is absolutely the best way to explain that question as well. If you look at this picture, this was 2002, when they bought the land. There was a couple of sheep running around here, there's a shepherd. And if I look at that picture and I see what I see outside now, it explains the whole word creation. Something started from scratch, turned into something beautiful. In 2003 is when we started uh, planting the vines. We imported all our vines from France to our nursery in South Africa, all virus free. So currently we also have a mother block for Vigitech. And they come and take our cuttings every year to establish more virus free material in South Africa as well. 2006 is when we harvested our first batch of grapes. That was before our cellar was complete. So that batch of wine was made off site. And in 2007, the cellar was completed. 2008, all the cultivars came into production. We've got about 10 different cultivars growing on the farm. And we've got about 40 acres growing around as well. So quite a big variety, but really small amounts of each of those wines. If you look at the, the list of wines we've got available, there's 20 different options. But it's really, you know, some of them are 2,000 bottles, some of them are 60-pound bottles. And it's a different, uh, it, it gives the consumer a bigger choice as well. You know, I had a question the other day asking me, don't you find it difficult to have so many different wines? A lot of people focus on one or two wines. I think with this way, everyone that walks in the tasting room will find something that they like. And also with wine drinking, there's trends. So, this month everyone drinks Chardonnay. Next month no one drinks Chardonnay, everyone wants something Blanc. And if you've got both in your portfolio, you'll always be busy, like Fred I said earlier, we're always busy. So there's always someone that comes here for a reason. I can't remember one year that we haven't sold out of everything that we've produced, so uh, it's a really good problem to have. It would be nice to be serving between 2012 now, for instance, but all sold out. So with the Viognier, we've incorporated the harvest part of the story as well, and we've made some mospolikis, which is a little mustard we take from the wine, you know, the process in between grape juice and wine. We take that sort of fermenting juice, we put it into the bread, which also helps the, the bread to rise a little bit as well. Then the harvest bread is also then served in a little nest, which resembles sort of the beginning, the birth of something new. And then we've done a little preserve for you with that. After we press out the juice from the grapes, we take the, uh, the, 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 the pips and the, and the skins and we make a little sweet preserve. Now, in fruit wine pairing, it's very difficult to have sweet flavors with dry wines. It often clashes, makes the wine bitter or sour. 
What we've done is we've left the pips in there as well, and when you bite through the pip, it's got a slight nutty crunchiness to it, but also a little bit of bitterness that sort of balances the sweetness together with the wine. There's a nice curry butter as well on the side, and as I said earlier, this is a beautiful wine to go with Asian, Thai food, spicy curries, creamy pasta dishes, even romantic sunsets. So with the curry flavors, it really just livens up the mouthfeel. And together with the bitterness, the sweetness, you almost get all these different flavors and tastes and textures that you need in your mouth to get from this wine as well. But very food-friendly wine, very versatile as well. Also beautiful with seafood dishes. So uh, I always say, don't believe everything I say. Just trust your palate and have fun. But try a little bit of the bread, try a little bit of the curry on it as well with the preserve. Always try your wine beforehand and then afterwards again and just see how the wine changes or how the food flavors influence the taste of the wine as well. Yeah. Alright. Enjoy. It's not a wine we come up with great, we come across. Not that often, no. In, in Europe? Um, it's, it's often used in the Rhone Valleys in France as part of the Rhone blends and they blend little bits of that, anything from 2 to 7 percent into the red wine. Because what happens if they've got a bad vintage, the Viognier ripens about two weeks earlier than the Shiraz, for instance. And then they blend it in, which has got a lot more sweetness there as well. So they ferment the grapes together. So they actually blend it in the tanks itself. So why are you getting away with it? Because when we harvested our first Shiraz, it came out fruity enough on the tail. As I said, this area is called Heaven and Earth, so we've got the best of both here. Um, I think the Viognier was a nice backup to have if, if we had similar problems to Europe. Um, but it came out fruity enough on its own, so there's no point of actually doing the Viognier in. But I tried it out of curiosity when I started here, because I know that in Europe they do it. Why don't we blend the Viognier in? And then when I tried it, it almost became too fruity. And it made exactly. So we've done the Viognier on its own since the beginning, and it's been a hit. I mean, the first year we, we made 3,000 bottles, it lasted three weeks. And every year we, we produce more and more and more Viognier, and every year it sells out. So, uh, it's quite popular and I think it's also because it's different. If you think of South African wines, the most popular ones, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, Chenin. And Viognier coming from a different area and different mouthfeel and flavors, it's just completely different. So people like different sometimes. And as I said, as a food wine, it's quite versatile. Curries, Asian, Thai, creamy pasta dishes. When I enjoy a nice glass of Sauvignon Blanc on a really hot summer's day with the acidity sort of boosts my you know energy level you know when the sun sort of sometimes squeezes you a little bit then the Sauvignon Blanc acidity is just quite uplifting and refreshing but as soon as the sun starts setting you want something a bit more round and more elegant and that's where the Viognier comes in as well we don't oak the Viognier at all Philip is going to tell us the story wow. right, guys. the story of creation Frida jou boord me net so wat draai boord en as die prank in die reg en hy doen vir duidelik hoekom Alright guys, so next chapter is called Written in the Stars and we, here we're going to be focusing on the Chardonnays. Now, the name of the chapter for me is all to do about how Carolyn and JC met and how they ended up in this beautiful area where Chardonnay does so well. So JC's background is his grandfather planted vines in Switzerland in the 1930s and he sort of went into the salmon business. Chardonnay's always been one of their top cultivars as well that they've done. And then the same with Carolyn, her father bought or started three wineries in South Africa as well. And if you read any sentence with the Finlayson name in Chardonnay is usually in between that story there as well. So for the for the two of them, one from Switzerland, one from uh, South Africa to get married, end up in this beautiful valley here uh, that Chardonnay does so well. We're currently doing three different Chardonnays, from the best to the best of the best to the best of the best of the best. And that's in the order there in front of you as well. We, uh, we don't do normal Chardonnay here. We leave that for the guys down the valley to make, and then we start with the best and work our way up from there. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> this area is well known for its Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So uh, the nice thing is that each producer's style is different as well, and we can even show that on one estate here as well, where we have these three different Chardonnays. Instead of just blending it all together and making one nice Chardonnay, we produce three different Chardonnays, giving the consumer a choice as well. So in front of you, the first one is a 2017 estate Chardonnay, that comes from four different blocks on the farm and that's a very nice, light, refreshing lunchtime Chardonnay for me. The nicest thing about our Chardonnay is the balance. It doesn't have that sort of oaky, smoky butteriness which makes you feel like you've carried a barrel on your back for two kilometers, you know, after drinking the first glass. I always say my favorite wine is something I can drink a bottle of and wish I had one more sip. Then I know it's a good wine. 
And with all three of these wines, they've got that certain element of balance. A lot of them has different structure as well. On the first one, a very lovely sort of citrusy element coming through as well. You almost don't taste the oak too strong. On the second one, which is the one I recommend with your pairing in front of you. Now, let's just really talk about the pairing. This is almost like a little piece of art. You know, most art, I don't have an eye for art. But when I look at when I look at certain art pieces, I just think, sure, this guy wasted a lot of paint. And then, you know, you have a glass of wine in your hand, you take one or two sips, someone tells you a story about the piece, and you tilt your head a little bit and it starts making sense. Now, I almost expect you to do the same here. What you have in front of you, do you guys remember the, the chapter of this name? Or the name of the chapter? Chapter 2, okay, but the name of the chapter? Written in the stars. So in front of you, you've got the black night sky. That's the black plate. With the stars and the moon in it. Right. Who doesn't see it? Just take another sip of wine. You don't see it yet. Oh, you do. Okay, you're just looking for an excuse to take another sip. Okay, that's great as well. So with the, the stars on the black plate, they, those are made with beef pollen and then orange mold and salt. We also have the mushrooms, which is the moon. And if you look at the moon tonight, you'll see it's just half a moon now. Three, four, five days ago, the guys who came in came in, got a full moon on their plate. Now it's only half a moon in the sky, so that's what you have on your plate as well. We often joke because the winemaker, when you ask him when something will be happening or when it will be ready, he usually, his answer is usually when the moon tells me to. So uh, we like to joke about the moon as well and you know the winemaking process. But then the moon is made with three different mushrooms. King oyster, shiitake and shimenji mushrooms. There's also three different oils on there as well. If there's not enough oil on your plate you can add a little bit more. There's a blend of the three oils as well. So the three oils we have is our own olive oil. There's some blood orange olive oil and then what everyone can smell is the truffle oil as well. Now as a child they always told me that the the moon is made from cheese, so we had to incorporate some cheese on the plate as well. So there's a little bit of pecorino, finely grated on top of the moon as well. Also has a nice sort of a nutty but saltiness, it lifts up all the fruit notes in the wine. And as I spoke about earlier, the fact that our Chardonnays are not that oaky and smoky and overpowering is a little bit of basil. So we've got a whole sheet of herbs that pairs with each of our wines, I think I mentioned it earlier as well. So basil is one of those that really picks up on the freshness of the Chardonnay as well. So enjoy the dish, but coming back to the wine, the reserve Chardonnay is a single side vineyard selection. So that's from a part of the block where we find there's a little bit more concentration. Over the years we've seen each of these different slopes that we have in the different vines has different sort of aspects, different altitudes, morning sun, afternoon sun, all those things influence how the grape is going to, to ripen and grow up. So um, with the reserve Chardonnay we get that single side vineyard selection, in the cellar, what we do is then we only use the free running juice and whole bunch press. So the first purest, cleanest juice, there's no fermenting on the skins at all. And then it goes into barrel with about 40% new oak for about 10 months, where the first one was only 25% new oak. Then the last one, the art. Now this is the wine that the winemaker makes for himself, in an ideal world to drink every day. The top 10 barrels selected within another vineyard selection. So the finest wine that he feels according to his palate that he can make. If you don't like it, he's very happy about that, then he'll drink it himself. But he's only made three and a half thousand bottles. Each bottle is numbered on the back as well. It comes in a beautiful wooden case, which I'll come and show you just now. And um, this is something... <laughs> Sorry? Furthest to the right. Yes, correct. So I poured them in the in, in the in the order. The state reserve art. And remind me, uh, shiitake, uh, king oyster, oyster and chimenjis. So the art is basically, the art is one vintage older than the previous two as well. Um, and I find that that's probably the most elegant wine in the whole flight. The estate, lovely citrus notes, a little bit sharper. The reserve for me is a little bit more elegant, more round, and more butterscotch and uh, little hints of honey coming through. But it still has that sort of bitter citrus grapefruit kind of carrot coming through. And then the art is everything that I want from Chardonnay. If, you know, if, if, so, if they tell me tomorrow that you're going to get death row, we're going to put you on an electric chair, you did something wrong. I know on the movies there's always this sort of happy twist where they, they offer the guy one last meal of his choice. I would say keep the food, give me a bottle of the Art of Chardonnay, and afterwards I'll flick the switch myself. I'm happy to go out on that. But that's my taste and palate. Like I said, if you guys don't like it, that's sort of a, a good thing for me. It means me and JC can drink more of that as well. So. Uh, Enjoy your next pairing. Quite a, 
Plain and simple pairing, but on the palate it's absolutely magical. You'll feel like you're in the stars. You'll be over the moon about this. <laughs> in the next chapter we're going to be doing, this is called Down Paradise Road. The, vin the, the, the cultivars that I poured for you in your glass now is the Pinot Noir. And this is one of those wines, a cultivars that, that does the best in the Yemen Arda Valley. You're not going to find your best Pinot Noirs in Wellington or Robertson, it's too hot there. Um, every producer down this road has got Pinot Noir as well. I would call this, and this is in my own plain way, I would call this the Burgundy of South Africa. All right. Um, there's some other areas in South Africa that does Pinot Noir as well, also in the cooler regions. But I think the top award-winning Pinot Noir so far has been coming from this region. So, with the, the Pinot Noir in general, for me the first thing that I like about Pinot Noir is the fact that you can drink a little bit more of it. I find if you open a bottle of Cabernet or Shiraz for lunch, and you drink a bottle of that, and then by 4 o'clock you want to take a little nap after the first bottle. But with Pinot Noir you can serve it nice and cool, it's refreshing on the palate, it's got lovely acidity, elegant fruit notes like strawberries, raspberries, on some of these you might pick up even a little bit of black cherry as well, so darker fruit coming through, and that's just due to the fact of the, the, the complexity of the wine and the levels. Um, but it keeps your palate fresh, and you can finish a bottle of this for lunch, and then still be there for the second and the third bottle we open later. So you don't miss out on life. So, regarding the flavor profiling of these wines, like I said, strawberries, raspberries, black cherries, lots of stone fruit sometimes coming through. We also have this sort of a earthy forest floor, wild mushrooms kind of character. A lot of people talk about farmyard when it comes to Pinot Noir. I don't think that this is what we find in our Pinot Noir. Farmyard reminds me more of cow dung and hay. And you actually get some of those, not my favorite Pinot Noir. Um, but this one has got more that, you know, when you walk into a wet forest and the pine needles and the mulch and everything is lying there and the mushrooms are growing through it and you really get a nice whiff of nature. Um, but also then, if you just take the beetroot from the soil, you pull it out and you smell it with the soil on it, through the beetroot, through the earthiness, you still get a little bit of that sort of uh, sweetness coming from the beetroot side as well. So uh, what we've been pairing for you with this last, uh, or this next dish, is a little bit of quail. And that's why I said the lemon soup is quite in, important to, you know, to give me the permission to dig in. It's very difficult to have this little delicate quail with a knife and fork. Um, but you just dig in with your hands and, you know, put it in your mouth and pull it out. It really works well. The nice thing about quail, it's a little bit richer than, uh, it's a little bit richer than duck. If you think of chicken, chicken is quite bland unless you flavor it. But with quail, it's got a little bit more of that sort of gamey bird flavor. Um, same with duck as well, which has also got nice fattiness to it as well. Then we've added the beetroot for you there to pick up on that earthiness, but also the sweeter flavors. On the acidity and the freshness of the wine, we've got the raspberries, we've got a little bit of barley at the bottom, and all of these elements you can sort of harvest from the farm itself as well. And then uh, last thing I wanted to say about the Pinot Noir, I totally forgot now. Oh, the three Pinot Noirs you have in front of you. The first one, the estate, whole farm, four different blocks again. Single, uh, single side vineyard selection on the reserve, where we get a little bit less water coming through to the, the vines as well, so the plant has to work a bit harder. And in the cellar we use up to about 40% whole bunch fermentation as well, to add more structure, mouthfeel and freshness. And then the last one, the art, then also barrel selection within the vineyard selection. This one we also got five stars at the Platter Guide last year, so we're quite proud of that. We've also got numerous other awards for the reserves and the estates before as well. And the estate is also listed on the BA First Class, which we're quite proud of. So, wow. That's, that's a good accolade, eh? Hey? Yeah, yeah. Enjoy it. Thank you. So, with a wine like this, I always say it's like a baby. If you think of a baby, first day when a baby is born, you hold it in your hand, you look at it, your heart melts, you love it. It just happens automatically. When you take it home, all it does is give you dirty nappies, fries at night when you want to sleep, and it pukes on you. And that doesn't mean you love it less. It doesn't mean it's broken either. It just means it's a baby. And you need to be patient, spend some time with it, give it a fair chance to develop and mature. And a good red wine, very similar in my opinion. Where you have to find something you like from, from the beginning. You can't make a bad wine taste better. And then when you taste it, I like that, I like that. It is young, so I'm going to be fair and put this in my cellar for five years and see how well it matures and age. So the problem with young parents, the only thing when they, well, the only thing they want to hear when they hear the analogies, I hear the baby cry 
guys would know, you say I must put it in the cellar. All right. So with a wine like this, it's really starting to open up as a 15 now. So what we're going to be doing for you, the dish was a, was a silent one, that one. No one got it. <laughs> one, out of, one out of seven, not too bad. Yeah, I don't have a cellar, but yeah, it would have been on my mind. Yeah, yeah. So, um, We've been, the next recipe with, or dish we're going to do for you, we've done this recipe for the last eight, eight years with the murder. It just works, it's something that we've, we've changed the recipe, uh, the menu a hundred times, but this pairing just keeps sneaking in with the murder every, every year. And it's a little cauliflower, celeriac and gorgonzola soup. There is one or two elements in the recipe that changes current, with the current vintage that we're serving for you. Um, but this, this next one with the reserve, which has got a lot more of a fresher fruit element coming through, together with that sort of oak smoke spices cigar box, we've done a little bit of blueberries with the cauliflower soup. So quite a weird element to add to cauliflower. I wouldn't think as a chef at home to put these elements together. But once you have the wine with it, it all starts making sense on the palate. All right, the soup does ground the tannins a little bit, lift up the fruit notes, so it does make the wine a bit easy accessible at a young age on the palate. Yeah, it's like a cricket bat. It's like exactly because it's quite structured. That's why you also use that specific glass. It's a lot taller yeah. glass than the others. So a full glass of wine is up to there, and the distance between your nose and the actual wine is much further away. Yeah, okay. So yeah, a little bit of science. Any questions? 